John Singer Sargent was the most sought-after portrait painter of his generation. His virtuoso brushwork, unerring eye, and bold vision gave posterity canvases that are among the jewels of the greatest museums in the world. Those who watched him at work noted the way he often rushed at a canvas from a distance and jabbed at it with his brush to capture a detail. Almost, one might say, as a conductor uses a baton to bring out an accent or to indicate the sweep of a passage. The movement and harmonious proportions of Sargent's paintings have always affected me in much the same way that music does. His childhood friend Vernon Lee remarked that the painting Carnation Lily, Lily Rose was, of any pictures ever painted, perhaps the one that brought her the same artistic happiness as the slow movement of certain Mozart quartets. My name is Eric Riding, and as a musician and a lover of art, I was delighted to learn that Sargent's canvases and drawings, which for decades had captured my heart, were created by an artist who was himself deeply involved in music. It was an affectionate relationship that extended from his childhood to his final years. Sargent died in London on April 14, 1925, just before he was scheduled to travel to the United States to install the last panels of his murals for the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. In November of that year, the museum unveiled Mr. Sargent's mural decorations over the main staircase and the library of the museum, with a memorial exhibition of Sargent's works. These were the legacy for which Sargent is justly remembered. Stunning portraits, landscapes, domestic interiors, street scenes, watercolors. John Templeman Coolidge, a trustee of the museum and himself a painter, wrote an appreciation of Sargent for the catalog in which he remarked, His three great devotions were his family, his painting, and his music. Many others also commented on Sargent's love of music. The New York art dealer Martin Birnbaum recalled when he first met Sargent. I liked the directness of his gaze and the simple candor of his voice, and I did not then surmise that he could be moved to tears by a Boston Symphony concert. The master violinist Yosef Joachim reportedly observed, Had Sargent taken to music instead of painting, he would have been as great a musician as he was a painter. The composer and violinist Charles Martin Leffler similarly remarked, I do not know whether Sargent ever tried himself in musical composition, yet there is no doubt in my mind that had he chosen to become a musician, he would have risen to eminence in our art in one way or another. And the pianist and composer Percy Granger wrote, The things he especially enjoyed in music the things he emphasized in his musical comments, the details his musical memory retained, were all highly specialized points, rare sparks of genius, highlights of original workmanship that the average musician, professional or amateur, usually misses entirely, and that, as a rule, only great composers can be expected to appreciate consciously. John Singer Sargent was born in Florence, Italy, in 1856 to American parents who hailed from Philadelphia. His father, Fitzwilliam, was a physician. His mother, Mary, painted watercolors and played the piano. After the couple's first child died at age two, however, she grew ill, despondent, and restless in Philadelphia. In 1854, with a view to curing her malaise, the Sargents moved to Europe, which would become their permanent home, though the years on their new continent would be nomadic. This meant that John's education would be gathered less from schools, which were always changing as the family moved from one city to another, than from his parents' tutoring. Fitzwilliam also had artistic skill and was a knowledgeable, cultivated writer. He authored two books, one defending the Union during the American Civil War, the other offering instruction on bandaging and minor surgery. He is said to have supplied the illustrations himself. It was John's mother, however, who gave him his first music lessons and encouraged him to paint. In 
he took to both arts readily. One visitor to the sergeants recalled meeting their son when he was 13 and characterized him as a big-eyed, sentimental, charming boy, playing the mandolin very pleasantly. If the portable mandolin was the instrument he had in his hands at 13, it was the piano that he was best remembered for playing, though he often sang as well. Music was an integral part of the family's activities. His mother had given him piano lessons when young, before entrusting him to professional instruction. At 14, he was playing works by Mendelssohn, Schubert, and Beethoven. His sister Violet would also become a fine pianist, as well as a singer and guitarist. And Violet's daughter Rosemarie, one of Sargent's favorite models, would likewise find pleasure and solace in music. When Sargent's prodigious artistic talent became apparent, Fitzwilliam accepted that his son, for whom he had envisioned a naval career, should be allowed to pursue the life of an artist. In April 1874, Fitzwilliam wrote to a friend about the family's plans for John. Everyone says that Paris will be the best place to find such advantages as we would like to give him, he observed. So the family moved to Paris in May, and the 18-year-old John entered the atelier of Carolus Durand. There he would meet a fellow American, James Carroll Beckwith, who would become a lifelong friend. They were favorites of Durand, who enlisted them both to help him with a grand ceiling painting, now in the Louvre, in which you can spot Sergeant Beckwith and their teacher partaking in the Baroque splendor. Sargent often worked in Beckwith's studio during his early studies in Paris. In March 1875, he wrote to a friend, We cleared the studio of easels and canvases, illuminated it with Venetian or colored paper lanterns, hired a piano, and had what is called the devil of a spree. Dancing, toasts, and songs lasted till four. In short, they say it was a very good example of a Cartier Latin ball. By August, Beckwith and Sargent were sharing a studio on 73 Rue de Notre-Dame-des-Champs, and Sargent apparently had a piano installed, since Beckwith drew him practicing on one in their shared space. Beckwith returned to the United States in 1878, and built a solid career there as an artist and teacher, though nothing that matched Sargent's titanic success. Beckwith's diaries show his immense affection for and admiration of his old friend, who would soar into the art scene's stratosphere. Despite his ever-growing fame, however, Sargent kept in contact with Beckwith and would visit him in New York when he was in town. Music was a shared interest, in November 1887, they both attended Richard Wagner's Tristan und Isolde at the Metropolitan Opera, which featured Albert Niemann and Lily Lehmann, both of whom had sung at Bayreuth in the 1876 debut season of Wagner's Ring Cycle. Sargent adored Wagner's music, while Carol found it heavy going. The friendship between the two artists lasted till Carol's death in 1917, and even beyond, it seems, since Sargent is believed to have touched up some of Carroll's unfinished paintings so that his widow could sell them. The Cirque d'Hiver, or Winter Circus, is still an active venue for entertainment in Paris. It started as the Cirque Napoléon in 1852 and was renamed the Cirque d'Hiver in 1870. Among the performers at this theatre was the Padelou Orchestra, established by Jules Padelou in 1861. In 1879, Sargent made two oil paintings of an orchestral rehearsal at the Cirque d'Hiver, as well as a number of studies. The ensemble is generally thought to be the Padelou Orchestra. If you're only familiar with one of the oil paintings, the roughness of the images might make you think it was tossed off quickly, without planning. But the sketches and the second oil painting show that Sargent had given the composition plenty of thought and wanted to create a sense of swirling, active music-making, with a faceless conductor commanding his forces. In one of the two oils, 
we see some of the clowns from the circus enjoying the show. One of Sargent's lifelong passions was Spanish music. He visited Spain in 1879 and 1880 with the primary purpose of studying the works of Diego Velázquez in the Prado Museum. While there, he became enchanted by the land and its culture, especially its music and dance. Vernon Lee wrote, As a young man, Sargent was, and perhaps remained, especially attracted by the bizarre and outlandish. Spanish dancers, the Haleo and the wonderful fronts piece to Miss Strettle's translations, posed and lit up in enigmatic fashion. Miss Strettle was Alma Strettle, a friend of Sargent's from his time in Broadway, a scenic village in England where Sargent was a member of an artist colony. She was not only interested in Spanish and Italian folk songs and poetry, but was also a musician who reportedly sang through Wagner scores to Sargent's accompaniment, with Sargent singing the male parts. Her sister, Alice Comans Carr, was also a passionate Wagnerian. In 1887, Sargent and others contributed artwork to Strettle's collection of Spanish and Italian folk songs in English translation, which included transcriptions of a few pieces. For a time, Strettle was the owner of Sargent's painting Spanish Dance, which also exists as the frontispiece to her book. According to Sargent's cousin and fellow artist Ralph Curtis, Sargent witnessed the dance in Granada and recreated the scene from memory in Curtis's studio in Paris. In later years, at his studio in Tite Street, as Sargent's friend and biographer Evan Charteris wrote, He would entertain himself, and on occasion try to entertain his guests, or beguile the tedium of the sitting, with a gramophone and records of Spanish music. That stuff, speaking of Spanish folk songs, he said, is at the bottom of all good music. Sargent's most famous painting depicting a Spanish dancer is surely El Jaleo, a work that has long been a centerpiece in Boston's Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Painted in the early 1880s, it conjures up the movements of a passionate flamenco dancer and the ambient sounds of guitars, clapping hands, and wailing voices. One of the most celebrated of Sargent's Spanish musicians was Carmen Cita, best remembered as a dancer, though she was also a singer who played guitar, mandolin, and castanets. Exactly when Sargent first saw Carmen Cita dance is unclear, but in 1890, in New York City, he was absolutely taken with this 21-year-old ball of fire. In February, he and Beckwith went to see her dance at Coster and Beals, an entertainment establishment on West 23rd Street, and were duly floored. When inspired by the music, which begins as she enters, reads a contemporary promotional account, she undulates and twists and turns and rises and falls and stands in every possible position except on her head and does steps not laid down by ballet masters and altogether sets ordinary art at defiance. You understand why artists clap their hands and cry, Brava! Bravissima! And why John Sargent is painting her portrait. She's just the subject for his free and original brush and ought to inspire the best that is in him. Some days after Carmen Cita's performance at Coster and Beals, Beckwith gave a party at which Carmen Cita danced, arriving at midnight and leaving around three, with Sargent escorting her home. Sargent was so enraptured by Carmen Cita that he painted his portraits of her on his own initiative without a commission. Carmen Cita, however, did not enjoy maintaining a static pose while modeling. One account reports that Sargent used to paint his nose red to rivet her childish interest upon himself, and when the red nose failed, he would fascinate her by eating his cigar. This performance was the dancer's delight. Sargent was determined to pique the interest of Isabella Stewart Gardner in this bewilderingly superb creature, as he called Carmen Sita. 
Gardner was a wealthy Boston patron of the arts, whom we'll encounter again, and Sargent hoped he might entice her to buy his latest masterpiece. He arranged to have Carmen Sita perform at William Merritt Chase's 10th Street studio, and differing accounts of that night exist. A number of worthies from the art and society worlds were there. Carmen Sita arrived at the studio late in the evening, and Sargent, appalled by her hairstyle, immediately set about fixing it with a wet brush while applying a wash rag to her makeup. She was livid. What follows next depends on which source you consult. She danced to the accompaniment of guitars. In one telling, Carmen Sita tossed a rose at Sargent, who was sitting on the floor. He picked it up and suavely used it as a buttonhole. Another version of the incident, however, reports an enraged Carmen Sita violently throwing the rose in Mrs. Gardner's face, with a gallant guest picking it up and tucking it into his lapel, thereby calming a potential storm. Either way, Gardner didn't buy Sargent's portrait, which now hangs in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. Chase, who lent his studio for the event, was also inspired to paint Carmen Sita. His portrait is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Carmen Sita continued to play a part in Sargent's life later in the year. In October, the budding artist Lucia Fairchild Fuller wrote in her diary that Sargent had shown her his photographs of Carmen Sita, whom of course, she noted, he admires beyond anything. In the mid-1890s, he arranged for Carmen Sita to perform in his London studio on Tite Street. One of the guests was Graham Robertson, himself the subject of another much-admired portrait by Sargent. Robertson recalled that the dancer and her guitar players required about half the studio for their evolutions. After her first dance, which Robertson found overdone, she returned in new attire. She wore no jewels, only one dark red rose behind the ear. And she sang the wild crooning Paloma, and as she sang, she circled with splendid arm movements, the feet hardly stirring, the white train sweeping and swinging around her. Then Sargent came to her, whispering a request. She looked angry, then sullen, shaking her head violently. He persisted, and opening a great cupboard in the wall, held out to her a beautiful white shawl with long fringes. She still hesitated, pouting, then snatched the shawl, threw it over her shoulders, flicking him in the face with the fringe with the impudent gesture of a gamin, and slowly crouched down upon a low stool, her face now grave, her hands in her lap. From the guitaristi behind her came a low thrumming, a mere murmur, and softly, under her breath, Carmen Sita began to sing. Old folk songs she sang, mournful, haunting, with long cadences and strange intervals. And as she sang, she clapped her hands, softly swaying to the rhythm. And her beauty changed. The tawdriness fell away. She became ageless and eternal, like the still figures of Egyptian sculpture. In October 1890, Sargent left New York to attend a wedding in Boston, where he stayed with the Fairchild family, with whom his younger sister, Violet, was then living. She was friends with the family's two daughters, Sally and Lucia, who, as Lucia Fairchild Fuller, would later gain fame as a painter of miniatures. The 17-year-old Lucia plainly worshipped Sargent. She was already interested in becoming an artist and would soon study in New York City with William Merritt Chase and Henry Siddons Mowbray. In her diary, she recorded countless details of Sargent's habits and thoughts including, of course, his devotion to music, which was evidently also a part of her life. In fact, her younger brother, Blair Fairchild, would go on to become a professional composer. <laughs> 
Sargent's discussions about music revolved largely around two of his musical heroes, Gabriel Fauré and Richard Wagner. He knew the music of both composers intimately, not only as a listener, but also as a player. He spoke of the Valkyl music in Wagner's Götterdammerung as he was playing, saying how fine it was, after all the troubled music, to come on those grand cubic chords. And later, upon playing the wedding march from the same opera, Sargent commented, Magnificent! It's so splendid, very barbarous, don't you think so? After dinner, Violet Sargent and Mr. Sargent spoke of his love of Foray's songs. Someone asking him if Miss Eames hadn't good style in her singing, he said it seemed to him so, but that after all he didn't know. He really knew nothing about singing. Sargent came back to lunch, and for about half an hour afterwards played, I think it was some gondolier music of Brahms, but I'm not sure. In the evening, too, he played Parsifal. He played the Flower Maiden's music, which he especially loves. In August 1891, Lucia stayed with John and Violet Sargent at Morgan Hall in the town of Fairford, England, where Sargent and his friend Edwin Austin Abbey shared a studio in which they worked on their murals for the Boston Public Library. Again, Lucia kept detailed notes on Sargent's habits and opinions. He played out of Parsifal, the first and second acts, the beginning of the Flower Maiden music all through, and then Abby asked him to play the Meistersinger Overture, which he did, and the soliloquy of Hans Sachs, and rather more. He played a good deal early in the afternoon, first Parsifal, because I asked for it, and then suddenly breaking off. Now I'm going to give you some good vulgar music, said he, the Meistersinger. I was drawing and said, do you think the Meistersinger vulgar? Oh yes, said he, right here I do. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, you know that place where they all come marching in. Jolly music, don't you like it? All evening he has been playing a great deal too. Hungarian music, then Spanish, and then a bit of the unfinished symphony. And then Glees, which he and Abby and Dr. P sang together. Carnation, Lily, Lily, Rose among them. Before Abby moved into Morgan Hall in 1891, he and Sargent had both spent several years as part of an artist colony in Broadway, another quaint English village in the Cotswolds. The main residences were first Farnham House and then Russell House, where the American artist and writer Frank Millet lived with his wife Lily. As might be expected, Broadway was a magnet for artists and writers. Among those drawn to this community were Henry James, Edmund Goss, and the Dickens illustrator Fred Barnard, whose two daughters were immortalized in Sargent's canvas, Carnation Lily, Lily Rose. Abby wrote about life at Broadway in September 1885. We are all busy as bees at Broadway. We've been quite a large colony. Goss has been here for a month, and Sargent has been painting a great big picture in the garden of Barnard's two little girls in white lighting Chinese lanterns hung about among rose trees and lilies. There are three models down from town, all eating their heads off today. We have lots of music, Sergeant plays, and Miss Gertrude Giswold sings to us like an angel. In November, Sergeant's obsession with Wagner might have become taxing for Abby. We have music until the house won't stand it. Sargent is going elaborately through Wagner's trilogy, recitatives and all. There are moments when it doesn't seem as if it could be meant for music, but I dare say it is. Edmund Goss recorded a shocking conversation with Sargent at this time during a walk in Broadway, in which Sargent, after some professional disappointments, aired the idea of giving up art altogether. But then I cried, whatever will you do? Oh, he answered, I shall go into business. What kind of business? I asked in bewilderment. Oh, I don't know, with a vague wave of the hand. Or go in for music, don't you know? The stories of Sargent going elaborately through Wagner's ring cycle don't seem exaggerated. And for those unfamiliar with this music, 
It's extremely complex harmonically, rhythmically, and melodically. Sargent evidently had no trouble playing the piano reduction of a score for large orchestra, and he often sang the male roles. One of the most entertaining anecdotes concerning Sargent and Wagner comes from Sargent's student, Julie Heinemann, who recounted a party in London that featured the mezzo-soprano Blanche Marchese and the baritone Dennis O'Sullivan. It was a very hot night in July, and Madame Blanche Marchese and Dennis O'Sullivan worked through the whole of Tristan, taking all the parts, tenor, bass, baritone, contralto, or soprano in turn, even singing the chorus parts together. The windows were wide open and a great crowd collected outside, for both Madame Marchese and Dennis O'Sullivan were plainly visible, and both, in wild spirits, accompanied their singing by very dramatic gestures. Mr. Sargent had not succumbed to the temptation of divesting himself of anything. They were all too absorbed to be conscious of the heat or any other discomfort. But when they had come to the end, the unhappy pianist rose with his shirt and collar wilted, and feeling and looking, as he expressed it, like claret frappé. Nonetheless, he wrote the next day, What a good time we had last night! As an ardent Wagnerian, Sargent was predictably attracted to others with a similar passion, all the more so if they had actually known the great man. In 1883, Sargent spent much of his time in Brittany, working on the famous or infamous portrait of Virginie Gautreau, generally known as Madame X, with her provocatively bared shoulders and lavender-tinted flesh. It may well have been around this time that Sargent visited Judith Gautier, who lived not far from the Gautreau's summer house. Judith's father was the eminent author Théophile Gautier, who preached the gospel of art for art's sake and was himself interested not only in literature, but also in music, theater, dance, and the visual arts. Both Judith and her father wrote favorable articles on Richard Wagner's music when it was controversial to do so, and Judith was on good terms with Jules Padelou, whose orchestra, as we have seen, performed at the Cirque d'Hiver in Paris and often promoted Wagner's works. We had the fanaticism of priests and martyrs, she wrote about her early passion for Wagner. Each Sunday, when Padelou played selections from Wagner, Homeric defiances were hurled between the opposing camps in the body of the concert hall, and the interference of the town guard was often required to prevent actual hand-to-hand -hand conflict. The young Judith sent her glowing articles on Wagner's music to the composer, who in turn invited her to his home in Lucerne, Switzerland, which she visited in 1869, when she was in her mid-twenties. She wrote a book-length account of her relationship with Wagner, and it is widely thought that they were lovers in the composer's last years. Wagner certainly wrote tender letters to Judith, and she has been put forth as a muse for his final music drama, Parsifal, a work dear to Sargent's heart. It would have been natural for Sargent, a 26-year-old devotee of Wagner, to seek out Gautier, a woman of striking beauty and remarkable talents. She was a poet, a novelist, a translator of Chinese and Japanese, an essayist, and a deep well of intimate anecdotes about Wagner. Today, said he, let us make peace with the Meistersinger. The master believed, in spite of my efforts to convince him to the contrary, that I did not care for the Meistersinger. The truth is that all I had heard of the opera was a few fragments played at the popular concerts or at the piano. All that I knew delighted me, but Wagner would not believe it. I do not want you to misunderstand this work, said he as he opened the book. And for several hours he went through the score, playing, explaining, commenting with wonderful kindness. Sargent depicted Judith standing by her piano, reclining outdoors, leaning forward, and, perhaps most famously, standing on the beach, holding her hat to prevent the wind from blowing it off. Eleven years her junior, Sargent seemed enthralled by the charms of this extraordinary woman. <laughs> 
a number of Sargent's other friends and acquaintances were also avid Wagnerians, such as the wealthy American Winneretta Singer. No relation to the Singer side of Sargent's family, but an heiress of the Singer sewing machine fortune. Though gay, she married two French princes, and is usually referred to today as the Princesse de Polignac. A discriminating patron of the arts, she commissioned a full-length portrait of herself from Sargent, and was such a devoted Wagnerian that she hoped to purchase Wagner's manuscript of Parsifal, a work she had experienced at Bayreuth. Not only that, at Sargent's recommendation, she commissioned the sculptor Jean-Joseph Carriès to design for her an elaborate portal for a separate room that was to house the longed-for manuscript. Carriès constructed a full-size plaster model for the portal and worked on the project for years. But he died before he could complete his masterpiece, and Winoretta never acquired the manuscript, her holy grail. In the later 19th century, it was common to find music enthusiasts who loved Wagner but dismissed Brahms, or who revered Brahms and thought that Wagner was overblown and pretentious. Many, of course, appreciated what both had to offer. George Henschel seemed to fall into that category. He was a German baritone and conductor who wrote extensively about his friendship with Brahms. In August 1887, Henschel met Sargent, and the two got on famously. Henschel recalled, A very proficient executant on the piano, he was exceedingly fond of music, a subject on which he talked with the knowledge and understanding of one who had made it a serious study rather than a pastime. Although Henschel did not appear in staged operas, he knew the operatic repertoire and had traveled to Bayreuth for the premiere of The Ring. Among the subjects he discussed with Brahms was Wagner's music, and on one occasion Brahms mentioned that he had a particular dislike for Tristan. As it happened, when Henschel posed for Sargent in 1889 at the painter's invitation, Sargent had a special request. He made me stand on a platform and sing from Tristan and Isolde by preference, whilst he was at work. Now and then he would slowly and deliberately recede about a dozen steps from the easel, look at me steadfastly, stop for a moment, and suddenly the brush lifted, ready for action, and without ever taking his eyes off me, made a dash for the canvas on which he then recorded his impression generally accompanying the act by contentedly humming a little tune. In addition to being a singer, Henschel could play the piano and direct an orchestra. In fact, he would become the very first conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra and the founder of the London Symphony Concerts, as well as conductor of the Royal Scottish National Orchestra. Now, the man who founded the Boston Symphony Orchestra was Henry Lee Higginson also memorialized by Sargent in an imposing portrait. Higginson amassed his wealth in his father's brokerage and banking firm, but he had studied piano in Vienna and retained a love of music throughout his life. Determined to establish an orchestra in Boston, he was impressed when, by chance, he heard Henschel conduct at the Harvard Musical Association. Later, as Henschel recounted, Colonel Higginson asked me to meet him, and he revealed to me his plan of establishing in Boston, on a firm financial basis, an annual series of orchestral concerts on a large scale, and asked me if eventually I would undertake to form the new orchestra and be its first conductor. He also hinted at a very substantial salary being, as he remarked, sensible of the fact that such a position would naturally not leave me as free to earn as much by my singing as would otherwise be the case. In Higginson's set was another Boston swell whom we've encountered before, Isabella Stewart Gardner, whose full-length portrait by Sargent, showing her in a low-cut dress with strings of pearls hugging her slender waist and resting on her hips, caused a stir only slightly less controversial than the eruption created by Madame X 
It's perhaps no coincidence that the scandalous Madame X was the portrait that, through the maneuvering of Henry James, had initially kindled Gardner's interest in the young artist. The portrait of Gardner found praise at its unveiling, but after some public and private comments that suggested indelicacy in Sargent's treatment of Belle Gardner's décolletage, her husband refused to let the portrait be shown any more in public, though she herself considered it one of Sargent's finest works. In any case, Mrs. Gardner and Sargent often went to concerts together in later years, and music was clearly a passion they had in common. It was probably at Gardner's Venetian-style palazzo known as Fenway Court, now the famous Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, that Sargent first heard the 17-year-old virtuoso violinist Yasha Heifetz, whose vigorous arm motions the artist preserved in a kinetic sketch. One of Gardner's early protégés was another young violinist, the German-born Charles Martin Leffler, whose teachers included Josef Joachim, whom we'll encounter again shortly. Leffler's resume at 20 already included a position in the Pas de Loup Orchestra in Paris and in the New York Symphony Orchestra. Leffler would soon become assistant concertmaster of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, a position he held for years. In 1887, he played the violin solo of Édouard Lalo's Symphonie Espagnole with that orchestra. In the audience was John Singer Sargent, who eagerly met the violinist in the artist's room afterward and arranged for a meeting at the gardener's. On this delightful occasion, Sargent played with me, en petit comité, the Symphonie Espagnole, in which he revealed himself as the admirable musician which he innately was. He was quite amazing in accompanying the third movement, Antemeg, a quite splendid piece of music with rather complicated rhythms in 5-8 time, which he played with complete musical and rhythmical understanding, verve and spirit. Years later, in April 1903, Leffler was at Fenway Court rehearsing his own music to present as a gift to Isabella Stewart Gardner for her birthday on April 14th. Sargent, as it happened, was also in residence at Fenway Court, painting Mrs. Fisk Warren and her daughter Rachel in the Gothic Room. Mrs. Fisk Warren, incidentally, also had a musical background, having studied voice at the Paris Conservatory with Faure when she was a teenager. Sargent took out a few hours from that project to dash off a quick portrait of Leffler and presented it to Gardner as his own birthday gift. Other violinists painted by Sargent include Johannes Wolf, a Dutch player who, like Leffler, at one time played in the Pas de Loup Orchestra. He had a reputation as a society violinist and performed for Queen Victoria. In June 1890, George Bernard Shaw wrote that Wolf was now to be heard in all directions, playing difficult pieces as if they were easy, and easy pieces as if they were immensely important and difficult, but always coming off with distinction. The painter addressed the violinist as his friend. Exactly when Sargent and he first became acquainted is something of a mystery, though Wolf played Faure's Violin Sonata No. 1 in 1896, a year before this portrait was made, and might have come to Sargent's notice through a shared appreciation of Faure's music. Unlike the forgotten Wolf, Josef Joachim continues to hold a revered place in the violin pantheon. Born in 1831, Joachim attracted the attention of respected teachers in his youth and gained the admiration of Felix Mendelssohn, who took the young man under his wing, guiding his studies and even performing with him. Joachim later became friends with such eminent musicians as Clara Schumann, Johannes Brahms, and Franz Liszt. The violinist made his London debut in March 1844, and a ceremony to commemorate the 60th anniversary of that occasion took place in London on May 16, 1904, at Queen's Hall. Edgar Spire, an influential musical patron who knew Sargent personally, approached him with the idea of making a portrait of Joachim for the big event. 
By this time, however, Sargent was positively fleeing from portraiture. Good heavens, I'm sick of portrait painting. I've just returned from Italy, where I buried myself for six weeks to escape the cursed business, and now you come and ask me to do another one. And that too, when I have a large number of old commissions still awaiting me here. Well, if it's Joachim, I must do it. Spire's wife, Leonora, was also a fine violinist. Born in Washington, D.C. to a German father and an American mother, she studied in Brussels and played for Joachim as a teenager. She shone as a soloist with the Boston Symphony Orchestra under the great conductor Artur Nikisch and made her London debut in 1899. With her first marriage ending in divorce, she found a more conducive partner in Edgar Spire, whom she married in 1902. A wealthy financier, he was involved in the construction of the London Underground, as well as in various philanthropic causes, especially musical ones, such as the promenade concerts, which continue to this day. Sir Edgar and Lady Spire brought some of the most important musicians of the day to London. Many of them played in their impressive music room. Richard Strauss dedicated his opera Salome to Edgar Spire, and Leonora played sonatas by Strauss and Faure, with the composers accompanying her at the keyboard. She also read through a draft of the first movement of Elgar's violin concerto, again accompanied by its creator. Among the priceless treasures in the Spire collection were 18th century violins by Stradivari and Guarneri, as well as a harpsichord by Rookers and Tosquin, which is now in the Brussels Museum of Musical Instruments. When Edgar Spire hired Sargent to paint a portrait of his wife, the painter seemed to relish the commission, which he finished in 1907 after more than 25 music-filled sittings. Sargent's biographer Charles Mount spoke with Leonora long after the event and preserved her reminiscences. Sargent asked to have the antique harpsichord moved to his Tite Street studio, and it is clearly visible in the background. Perhaps this put him in the mood for a taste of the Baroque. Play that thing by Bach, he called over his shoulder. But Mr. Sargent, it will sound awful alone. You accompany me on the piano. No, no, it'll be all right, he motioned with a slight impatience. And when she had finished, he asked for something else. He was listening to the music which served also to prevent her from talking while he wrestled with his problems. Despite his generous support of London's cultural life, Sir Edgar fell out of favor as the First World War made Germany the enemy of England. Spire and his wife both had German parents, and Spire had business connections and family in Germany. The press hounded him out of England, and in May 1915, the Spires returned to the United States, eventually settling in New York City's Washington Square, near a studio on the other side of the park where, coincidentally, Sargent had once worked back in 1887 and 1888. Although Sargent had no hesitation to ask musicians to perform for him, there were times when he wanted to join in the performance himself. Such was the case with Elsie Swinton, whose mother commissioned a portrait of her daughter as a gift to Elsie's husband, George Swinton. Though forgotten now, Elsie had a reputation as a fine singer, first as an amateur, later as a professional, who could sing effectively in several languages, including Russian. She was in her early twenties when she sat for Sargent and recalled the sessions. The picture was painted in 1896-1897. It took a great many sittings, as we wasted a lot of time playing the piano and singing, instead of getting on with the picture. Sometimes Sargent would even solve an artistic puzzle by pausing to play music. One unnamed sitter gave Sargent's friend and biographer Evan Charteris an account of a session she had in 1902. I wonder if the sitter might have been Mrs. Philip Leslie Agnew, whose portrait was indeed done in 1902, with several details matching those in the sitter's description of the portrait. Her husband Philip, by the way, was evidently a musician, having written a book on Wagner's Ring. <laughs> 
Sargent had been fretting, in particular, over how to capture the opals his sitter wore, and asked her one day to bring along her husband to the Tite Street studio. Her husband, she related, found Sargent in a depressed mood. The opals baffled him. He said he couldn't paint them. They had been a nightmare to him, he declared, throughout the painting of the portrait. That morning he was certainly in despair. Presently he said to my husband, Let's play a foray duet. They played, Mr. Sargent thumping out the bass with strong, stumpy fingers. At the conclusion, Mr. Sargent jumped up briskly, went back to the portrait, and with a few quick strokes, dabbed in the opals. He called my husband to come and look. I've done the damned thing, he laughed under his breath. What appeared to interest him more than anything else when I arrived was to know what music I had brought with me. To turn from color to sound evidently refreshed him, and presumably the one art stimulated the other in his brain. As eager as Sargent was to make music with his sitters and their guests, if he wanted to capture a singer in the act of performing, he could hardly be taking part himself in the music-making. For instance, in his striking painting of Mrs. George Batten, a musical patron and well-respected leader singer, a friend accompanied her as she sang, with her mouth open sensually, what some have thought to be the conclusion of Francesco Paolo Tosti's then-popular song, Goodbye. Though married, Mabel Batten had a romantic relationship with the author Marguerite Radcliffe Hall and set some of her poems to music. In this socially interconnected circle, it's little surprise to learn that another of Sargent's singer subjects, Elsie Swinton, programmed one of Batten's settings in her own recitals. Another musician whom Sargent caught in the act of singing was Ethel Smythe, here shown accompanying herself at the piano. Smythe was an outspoken feminist and notable composer of the day. Her opera, The Wreckers, was conducted and promoted by Thomas Beecham and Bruno Walter, who later invited her to share the podium with him in a program of her music performed by the Berlin Philharmonic. Her sister, Mary Hunter, had been painted by Sargent, and his friendship with Mary was well known. Some suggested intimacy between them. Evan Charteris wrote that Harry Brewster, Smythe's longtime artistic collaborator and occasional lover, she's perhaps better known for her love affairs with women, including Virginia Woolf, asked Sargent for a painting of her. Sargent entertained a deep admiration for the musical gifts of Ethel Smythe. Her singing found in him an enchanted listener, and it is in the act of singing that he drew her. Before that, he had been asked to paint her. In reference to the request, he wrote, Brewster for some time has wanted me to do ahead of her, a painting, and they say he wants her in a calm mood. Miss Smythe in a calm mood. Smythe herself recalled the session, perhaps forgetting that Sargent was drawing rather than painting. All the time, he kept on imploring me to sing the most desperately exciting songs I knew crying out as he hastily made dab after dab at his canvas, What's that? What's that? It took him only just over one and a half hours to draw what, according to some of his colleagues, is one of the most remarkable singing portraits extant. We're not sure exactly how the composer-pianist Léon de la Fosse came into Sargent's orbit, though a shared interest in the music of Foray would have been a point of attraction. De La Fosse's good looks might also have drawn Sargent's attention. De La Fosse certainly caught the eyes and ears of some of the leading figures of the Parisian aesthetic crowd. Marcel Proust, for example, some of whose verses De La Fosse set to music. Through Proust's efforts, De La Fosse became the protégé of Robert Comte de Montesquieu, the quintessential aesthete of the day. And both men would serve as models for characters in Proust's monumental work, in search of lost time. Sargent's portrait was evidently not a paid commission, but a token of affection. It is inscribed to Monsieur Léon de la Fosse, a cordial memento. De la Fosse was often an attraction at the houses of socialites and salons in Paris and London, and Sargent introduced him to the wealthy and influential. <laughs> 
Delafosse played for Sargent's friends and guests in the Tight Street studio, and the painter recommended him in glowing terms to Isabella Stewart Gardner. Sargent also sent her his portrait of the young man. Of course, Delafosse is a decadent, especially in the matter of neckties, but he is a very intelligent little Frenchman and a composer and excellent pianist, who is probably going over to America in a year's time. So I sent his portrait over as a forerunner. I shall make bold to give him a note of introduction to you, and I'm sure you will enjoy his playing and his French finesse. He is the only man who has taken the trouble to study certain difficult and beautiful piano compositions by Faure. Sargent followed up with another letter to Gardner. Do make him play to you. I am sure you will have the greatest pleasure in his wonderful talent, both as a composer and a virtuoso. In sending her the portrait, Sargent no doubt hoped to arouse her curiosity in the young man. She had a habit of becoming attached, as he knew, to handsome young musicians of talent and promise. Proust and Montesquieu were also well acquainted with Gabriel Faure whose name has come up here several times. He was the one living musician in Sargent's life who would unquestionably join the pantheon of great composers. It seems likely that they met through mutual friends in the 1880s, such as the amateur singer Amélie Duet and her painter husband Instange Duet, or the wealthy hostess Henriette Roger Jourdain. Faure dedicated his famous song Aurore to Henriette, and his equally popular song, Obad, to Amélie Duet. In addition, Sargent's connection with Winneretta Singer provided another direct link to Faure, since he was among the artists whom she supported and championed. In any case, Sargent was devoted to Faure's music and promoted it with great conviction, arranging to have his works played at his parties in the Tight Street studio, as well as in the fashionable homes of the London elite. Percy Granger remarked that Sargent had only to announce his approval of any musician for hostesses to spring up ready to engage these protégés, hoping that the performance of these musicians at their at-homes would guarantee them Sargent's coveted presence. Foray also had contact with some of Sargent's other portrait subjects, such as Elsie Swinton, to whom the composer gave music lessons once proposing that she might give him Sargent's luscious portrait of her as payment. Granger commented, The fact that Sargent bestowed upon the music of Gabriel Faure the greatest depth and intensity of his musical admiration and devotion is a convincing example of the rightness of Sargent's artistic vision, for Faure is one of those quietly great masters like Bach, César Franck, and Frédéric Delius, who in the main work hidden from the outer world of their own era, to emerge undyingly resplendent to future generations. But Sargent had in all musical matters the magically penetrating eye of genius. In addition, he had the comforting touch of a warming human heart. Near the end of Foray's life, when the composer was strapped for cash, Sargent found a way to help his friend financially by offering a substantial sum, one source says 2,000 francs, in exchange for one of his romances, which would be, as Sargent put it, an inestimable treasure. Foray responded by sending Sargent something far more valuable, the manuscript of his second piano quintet, one of the composer's last masterpieces. Several of Sargent's musical sitters, who were not known to the public, were nevertheless portrayed as musicians with their instruments. One is the young Catherine Vlasto, painted in her early twenties, with her right hand languidly resting on the keys of a piano. The melancholy atmosphere almost portends her death from appendicitis two years later. Madame Ramon Subercasso, by contrast, seems alive in this arresting portrait. She too is shown with her right hand on the keyboard, and we know that she played for Sargent during the session. The author of a two-volume book on Rome, she was the wife of a Chilean diplomat who was himself an amateur painter. 
The husband and wife had seen Sargent's work in Paris at the 1880 Salon, when he was just beginning his career, and were struck by the young man's evident talent. They paid a visit to Sargent and invited him to do a portrait of Madame, not, however, in his bohemian studio, but in their fashionable Parisian apartment. Though not a professional, Madame Subercasseau was a skilled pianist, which naturally appealed to the painter, as she recalled. He was very fond of music and had me play for him. He brought me several pieces from Gottschalk, whom he admired very much, especially his interpretations of Spanish and South American dances. He had been in Spain for a short time, and everything about that country left its impressions on him, and from it he drew his inspirations. The portrait was shown at the 1881 Salon and was a hit, earning Sargent a medal and greatly helping the struggling artist to make a name for himself. Madame Subercasseau was the sister-in-law of another enchanting woman who sat for Sargent, Eugenia Errasuris. Sargent, in fact, made several paintings and sketches of her, including The Lady in Black. She would become a frequent presence later in his life when she moved to London, where she supported avant-garde artists, as well as a young Polish pianist who would soon have an international career. Sargent ran into him one day as he was walking through Piccadilly. Rubenstein, what a nice surprise! I was talking about you last night with a charming old lady who was terribly anxious to see you. She has tried for years to find your whereabouts and asked me to help her. Do come tomorrow at four to my atelier at Tite Street. She will be there. I'm just making a sketch of her. After reconnecting with Eugenia Errasuris, the old lady in question, whom Artur Rubinstein had met in Paris years earlier, he asked Sargent about this singular woman who had a disconcerting habit of switching from one language to another in mid-sentence. And yet, Sargent said, shaking a finger at me emphatically, I have never known anyone with the unfailing, uncanny taste of this woman, whether in art, music, literature, or interior decoration. She sees, hears, feels, smells the real value, the real beauty. Rubinstein and Sargent had first met at the home of another patron of the arts, Muriel Draper, an American who, with her husband, Paul, lived in London for four years before the First World War and became active in its musical scene. Their at-homes in their music rooms on Holland Street and Edith Grove featured some of the finest musicians of the day. Not only Rubinstein, but also such luminaries as Pablo Casals, Jacques Thibault, Harold Bauer, and Georges Barrère, who happily played for a small but discriminating audience. Sargent and Henry James were frequent guests. While their main house was destroyed in the Second World War, the annex on 19A Edith Grove, where so many musical giants performed, survives. From the street, it looks like a shabby garage behind a modern apartment complex, but this drab-looking structure conceals a rich history. In his memoirs, Rubinstein describes a real friendship that existed between him and Sargent, and Charles Mount writes that Rubinstein used to stop by the Tite Street studio to play piano forehand repertoire with the painter. Sadly, I know of no portrait of Rubinstein by the artist. The piano virtuoso and composer Percy Granger offered a long appreciation of Sargent in Evan Charteris's important early biography. Granger, who was born in Australia, had much in common with Sargent. Both were attracted to the visual and the musical arts already in childhood. Both also moved around a fair amount early in life, with Granger entering the music conservatory in Frankfurt, Germany at the age of 13. In 1901, he and his mother moved to London, where Granger would soon make a name for himself, aided in part by Sargent. He remembered Sargent not just as a painter, but also as a musician. John Singer Sargent was one of the most outstanding musicians I have ever met. For although his musical technique was not as developed as his painting technique, he had the rarest of all aesthetic gifts, individualistic, balanced, critical judgment. 
His musical judgments, sympathies, and activities welled up instinctively out of his rich musical inner nature, and were not, as are the musical doings of many a gifted amateur musician, influenced by the opinions of professional musicians, or indeed by any ascertainable outside factors whatever. To hear Sargent play the piano was indeed a treat, for his pianism had the manliness and richness of his painting. Granger knew Sargent well enough to offer insights into his devotion to music. Sargent always seemed to me a typical Puritan, a typical New Englander in his musical life. Music seemed to be less a recreation to him than a sacred duty the duty of aiding a special musical talent wherever he found it. Sargent made a charcoal portrait of Granger in the spring of 1908, which Granger deemed quite excellent. He immediately had reproductions made and used them as promotional materials for his concerts. At the outset of World War I, Granger and his mother moved from London to the United States, where he became a naturalized citizen in 1918 though he continued to concertize widely throughout the world. While Sargent's friendship with Granger is well documented, his connection to Myra Hess is more obscure, though she had already achieved some fame in 1907, when, as a teenager, she performed Beethoven's Piano Concerto No. 4 under the baton of Thomas Beecham. Sargent made a charcoal drawing of her head in 1920, when she was an established recitalist, though she would achieve special fame years later with her lunchtime concerts during World War II, presented even during bombings. As a fearless Englishwoman who risked her life to prop up morale, and as a Jew to boot, she was a particularly potent symbol of British resistance to Nazism. Sargent's very last oil portrait was of George A. Macmillan, a member of the Macmillan publishing family. It was painted at a time when Sargent desperately tried to avoid commissions of portraits, as he derisively called them. Macmillan, however, was also a musician, a member of the Bach Choir and honorary secretary of the Royal College of Music. Perhaps it was just chance, but I can't help thinking that the musical connection made this last oil portrait a little more palatable for Sargent. Less than a month after painting Macmillan's portrait, John Singer Sargent died in his Tight Street studio, where so many ravishing paintings came into being, from the languid sensuality of Lady Agnew to the intense drama of Ellen Terry as Lady Macbeth, and where music continually nourished the soul and complemented the artistic powers of their creator.